<clears throat> we have Michael Muir has joined us, so we now have Ross Hanna and his son Michael Muir. And uh, I thought I'd ask Michael first to explain his name, how he came he came to be a Muir. Well, my, my legal name is Michael Hanna Muir. I kind of parted it in the middle. And I'm the only living direct descendant of John Muir, still with the Muir name. And I, I took the name back when I became an adult. I went to the Harrison County Courthouse in Kentucky, where I was living at the time, and I paid them $12. And I went before a judge, and he said, are you fleeing creditors, or are you avoiding any, uh, you know, uh, have you committed something illegal that you're trying to, to evade capture? And I said, no, sir, I'm, I'm just proud to be John Muir's great-grandson, and I'd like to take the name back. And he said, granted. And so my, my change of name, my legal change of name was recorded, and I've been Michael Muir my, my adult life. Um, <clears throat> John Muir had two daughters, and people who know the Muir genealogy are sometimes confused when I say I'm John Muir's great-grandson, and they said, well, how come you're Michael Muir when he had two daughters? And uh, that's, that's the story. Okay, I thought we'd just explain that so that people understand. Can you tell us how John Muir influenced your, your life's work, Michael? Well, he, he's well-known, John Muir is well-known to have inspired the world to explore and enjoy and protect open spaces and wild places. And I, I think he had a profound influence on his own family in that direction. He raised his daughters to appreciate nature and that's filtered down through the generations to, to me, down, down the line. My dad and my mom took the family up into the high Sierras every summer. My grandparents took us up into the Sierras every summer. So the outdoors have have always been there and and there's always been the awareness of John Muir and his powerful connection to the outdoors too. Um, for myself, my line of work, I've always been a horseman. Since I was 12 years old I've raised horses and I've, I've that's been my my life's work and what makes me different than the typical horseman is that I've lived with multiple sclerosis since I was 15 years old and my active life in nature and with horses have played a, a, an important role in keeping me as strong as I am today. And that's kind of led to the work that I do now. I'm the director of a program called Access Adventure, uh, which is a program of outdoor recreation for people with disabilities. We do some environmental education for kids. We are 4-H leaders. And we design and build wheelchair accessible horse-drawn carriages that take people like myself, <coughs> excuse me, with mobility challenges and take them out into nature. <coughs> and what is Rush Ranch? Can you tell us what... I'm going to have to get a drink of water, excuse me. <coughs> I got here then. Yeah. Well, they were here spot on before 9 o'clock. So. Yeah. Do you want me to not look at the camera to look at you when I'm talking, or do you prefer uh, that I look at the camera? I don't know. We'll probably mostly look at her, but you can go around. It's, yeah, it's, it's really informal. Yeah. It's not like TV or anything. Like All that. right. Yeah. Shall we roll again? Yeah. Let's roll. So, we were talking about Rush Ranch. How, what, what is this facility, and what do you do here? I've, I've been a horseman all, all of my life. I've had a farm in Kentucky. Uh, I've actually hitched wheelchair accessible horse-drawn carriages and driven from the Mission San Diego in California all the way to Washington, D.C. with a group of people with disabilities. And during that trip, we traveled through Kentucky where I'd had a farm in the 70s. And uh, I was eager to get back there. I love Kentucky. It's the center of the horse world in this country. And we had an offer there to set up the national headquarters of our organization called United States Driving for the Disabled. And I, I served two terms as president of that organization and lived in Kentucky there. And when I retired from that and returned to California to Solano County, I was looking for a place to live. And I heard that the land trust owned the Rush Ranch and they were looking for a caretaker. So I stopped out here and I walked in and I was blown away by the beauty of this wonderful place and 
realized that it was a, a horse farm. This is a historic horse farm. There was still old harness hanging on the walls and, and uh, it was a perfect place for us to launch a regional program to, to launch the, the beginnings of Access Adventure. And I went to the land trust, uh, proposed that we do this work here and they were very enthusiastic in supporting the idea and we've been here ever since. In 2005. Oh, 2005. The Rush Ranch is the first property purchased by the Solano Land Trust and it's 2,070 acres of preserved open space land. They bought it I believe in 1986 and since then they've acquired almost 20,000 acres of land in Solano County that is preserved and protected open space land or preserved farmland never to be developed. So here we are just two miles out of town but when you look to the south toward Mount Diablo, you, it might as well be 1850. You, you don't see any development. It's a, it's a wonderful place for us to live and work and it's very accessible for people in the Bay Area to get here and, and enjoy a day out in nature with the help of our horses. And what kind of activities do you have here then? The, the third Saturday of every month we kind of have a mini open house and we've got the historic blacksmith shop open and working we hitch our horses and give rides to all comers. We, uh, we're 4-H leaders. This is the day, the third Saturday of every month is, is 4-H day, so our 4-H students are here learning to, uh, to train and care for the horses and learning to drive, learning to do community service by assisting people with disabilities aboard the carriages. So it's a busy day and, uh, and we have, we're out here seven days a week taking care of the horses. We're open seven days a week. We, we, use, we use draft horses. We specifically like the French version of uh, the draft horse called the Percheron horse. And we also <coughs> breed a warm blood type of, of driving horse using Percheron blood and some other crosses too. We have a new stallion arriving today from Holland, uh, a Frisian horse that we're going to be using for the next two years. I don't. I, I actually, you know, the caretaker position was sort of withdrawn while they, they pulled down the caretaker's house and built this new visitor center and the caretaker's cottage and I got other accommodations before, you know, that idea ever came, came to fruition. But we, uh, we certainly put together everything else with the horses and I live about 10 miles away in the Gordon Valley, just to the south of here. Do you have siblings on my call? I have an older brother and a younger sister. And are, are they in the same kind of field of work? Do they follow your... Well, I think we're all different when you say Pops. That, yeah. Uh, you know, my brother is, uh, you know, he went into the family business as a cattle buyer, so he's kind of a horseman too, but he took it, you know, I went into the breeding game and showing horses and, and he was more of a working cowboy and a cattle man. He's retired now. My sister is highly allergic to horses so she doesn't get very close to them and uh, she works with the First Northern Bank. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And Ross, did you kind of, I mean, did they get this interest in, in the horses and outdoor life from you? Where, where, how did that come about? Well, I always, I always had horses which ran around the top of the hill up where we lived uh -huh. <clears throat> and the only way I could ever catch them, they, they were fairly gentle horses, they were good uh, riding horses and so forth, but they didn't like to come off the top of that hill and in the winter time I used to go up there with a with a rope in my back pocket and a bucket of barley, rolled barley, and I'd go up there and they'd come up to me and, and I'd hold that barley out and they would come up and get their nose in that bucket and I'd reach for that rope and they'd be off, and I couldn't catch them. I'd, every winter I'd go up and try to catch them, I couldn't. Mm -mm. But then as it dried out in the summer, they had to come down to the barn area to get, a, get their water. And there was a, a long, oh, about a 50 yard uh, walkway, corral, come down to the water thing. And I'd put a gate across that, and they'd come down at night, and they'd, they couldn't get in, so they'd wait around that gate. So I'd let the gate open, they'd go in and get their water, well then I kept them in the barn for a few days while I wanted to ride them and so forth. So I always had horses to ride. So you did ride horses. Yeah. 
And I helped Mike a little bit when he was raising horses. When I was a kid, my dad helped me. Or we lived in town, but I was determined to have horses. And uh, a neighbor down the road, we lived right on the edge of town, and a <coughs> fellow had a feedlot, and on the edge of the feedlot there was a barn with no roof. And he told my dad if he'd put a roof on the barn that I could keep horses there. <laughs> so I started riding my bike down to take care of the horses. And so it's really been a lifelong... Oh yeah, since I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And my dad certainly helped me and supported me in getting started with that. I would say my uncle John Muir Hanna, who died last December at 98, he... he uh, they know about him. He was probably the the most avid horseman yeah. in the family. Mm -hmm. And he also was really interested in what I would do. He would check in with me every now and then and keep up with my work. And He, he enjoyed horses a lot. How many people um, uh, take advantage of the services that you, you know, the organization? We, you know? we started Access Adventure with some borrowed horses and a handful of volunteers and 500 bucks and a 20-year-old wheelchair cart built by a Mennonite man in Kentucky. And that was in July of 2005, and it's grown really fast. We served over 4,000 people last year, and uh, this year, you know, we haven't come to the end of the year yet, but we'll beat that number by a considerable margin, probably reach 6,000 people. And you take these people up into the wilderness? Is that what you're doing? We, our home base is here, but we do travel around the county in the East Bay. Uh, we've launched an access adventure program, our first satellite in Sonoma County. That's going to get underway next year. And uh, we do about five major road trips each year where we go to remote scenic areas of California and go on camping trips and get as far off the beaten path as we can. Is it four or five days, huh? Yeah, up to, up to eight days. Really? Do you go along, No. No? I'm too old for that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I'm the great great grandson of John Strenzel, Dr. John Strenzel and his wife Louisiana. They were the the uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law of John Muir eventually, and uh, they came across the uh, the Southern Overland Trail and the old Butterfield Trail in 1849. They were 49ers during the Gold Rush coming out to California. They, they didn't have a leader, but they met Captain, Captain John Fremont, who had blazed this southern route into California, and he told them about it, and they set out with a company of people from Texas in the spring of 1849, and they reached the Mission San Diego in December of 1849. And they went up into the gold country, where they set up a very successful store, and they planted a vineyard and, and orchards, which were wiped out in a flood, and they wound up coming to the Alhambra Valley. And uh, I have some excerpts of letters that I could read about that history. Before we start, you want to tell us just who, uh, Dr. John, who Dr. John Strensel was, and where, where did he come from? What was his background, just briefly? Oh, I can I can read it. He write he writes his own history there. Sure. Why don't you bring it right over here and I'll sort through that. Incidentally, he was also they came out in a wagon train. What a hundred hundred and fifty people with big wagon train that came out in 1849, and he came along as a physician because he was a licensed physician from Poland. Yeah. So that's that's the way he got involved in this. And I believe, Mike, you can correct me on this, but uh, I think Dr. Strenzel and his wife were married in Tennessee? By no, Justice. no, I was telling this story. Well, I'll let it you tell the story then. My great-great-great-grandfather, Sam Irwin, <coughs> was married to a Southern Belle in Tennessee, and the Justice of the Peace that performed that marriage ceremony was... Davy Crockett. And Sam Irwin and his bride and Davy Crockett came out to Texas where they founded the town of Honeygrove. My 
great-great-great-grandparents stayed behind and Davy Crockett went on to the Alamo where he met his famous end. <laughs> and Sam Irwin didn't go or I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> they were the parents of Louisiana Irwin who married Dr. Strenzel, their daughter also named Louie, Louisiana, married John Muir and became my great-grandmother. Interesting name, Louisiana. Is there a history yeah. for the name? The, they had three daughters named Louisiana, Mary, Missouri, Indiana, and the boy was named Andrew Jackson. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like those names. All right, so you're going to read from uh, Dr. Spencil's? First I have to find it. It's written by his wife, I think. No, this is Dr. Strenzel. Oh, okay. I have, I have letters from her, too. <laughs> um, you asked who he was, and I can start with the first paragraph. This is the biography, or it's really the autobiography, of John Theophil Strenzel. I was born November 29, 1813, in the city of Lublin, Kingdom of Poland. My father, John Strenzel, was born in Pomerania in the year 1771. My mother's maiden name was Sophia Meisner. She was born in Lublin in 1785. They were married in 1803 and were extensive owners of city property. They had a large family of children, but all died before reaching maturity, except myself, a sister, and our brother. My parents and grandparents were Protestants and brought up their children in the Lutheran faith, although residing in a Catholic community. Several of my uncles served with distinction in the Polish army, two as surgeons, and my great uncle reached the rank of general of the commissary department in the Russian army. And he goes on, it's quite a long letter. Um, I think it's interesting, uh, to, to, he, they go on about their, their challenges of going across the plains from Honeygrove, Texas to uh, to the Mission San Diego. I'll read this part here after they, they made it to California. We arrived on the Tuolumne River April the 14th. This would be 1850. We're very much pleased and concluded to settle down. Thus ended our journey of nearly 13 months. We can now go on the cars, meaning railroad cars, to our old home in four days. Exclamation point. I selected a beautiful location about two miles below LaGrange, the nearest mining camp, and established a ferry, hotel, and a store of general merchandise for trade with the miners, put up large tents on canvas houses for all needs, as boards or plank were not to be had, paid all hired help $125 per month, flour $30 per sack of 50 pounds, milk $1 per quart, fresh butter, three dollars per pound, and provisions of all kinds proportionately high. Our experience at this place was varied and exciting. There was a great deal of travel at that time from Stockton and other points to the Mariposa and Burns mines, and one day we would entertain Colonel Fremont, Lieutenant Beale, General Miller, and other noted persons, and probably the next a lot of desperados passing through the country for the purpose of murder and robbery. Often a party of 15 or 20 miners came down and called for dinner. Then a band of digger Indians came to trade. All manner of people coming and going at all times of the day and night. One evening, a party of five or six Mexicans rode by and camped for the night near the river in sight of the house. Early next morning, about the same number of desperate looking white men rode up and asked if the Mexicans had crossed the river and on being informed that they had taken the river road and were camped nearby, they went on and in a short time we heard in quick succession about a dozen pistol shots. I knew what this meant and hurriedly took my wife and children to the boat, telling the ferryman to take them across to the other side until the trouble was over, while I returned to the house to await the result. But my wife was so anxious for my safety that she begged the man to take them back saying it was better for us all to die together. In less than half an hour, the white men came back to the hotel and ordered breakfast. They were very boisterous 
and said the Mexicans had stolen their horses and refused to give them up. So they had killed two or three of them and even exhibited the belts of gold dust taken from the bodies of their victims. The Mexicans fled, taking with them their dead and wounded, and we never knew how many were really killed. We afterwards learned that the Mexicans were on their return home from the mines and were supposed to have a large amount of gold with them, that the story of the stolen horses was a fabrication, and the sole object of following them was robbery. Some time after this, a Mr. Ruddle left his home on the Merced to purchase supplies in Stockton and was killed and robbed in broad daylight <coughs> within a few miles of our place. Such occurrences were frequent both in the mines and the country. No one was safe in traveling alone in those times. I must not omit to write something about the grizzly bears which infested this region in those early days. There was a great danger in hunting them. Mr. Mudgett, one of our comrades whose wife had died on the journey, settled with his children a few miles below us on the river. One day while out hunting, he shot a huge grizzly, wounding it severely, and before he could escape, the animal jumped upon him and tore him so badly that he died in a short time. Not long after this, an Indian was attacked by a large bear near LaGrange, and so severely hurt that for a long time his life was despaired of, but he finally recovered. The bear was killed and weighed 400 pounds. I myself met with a narrow escape from some grizzlies. I was riding over to Hornitos late in the afternoon and when not far from Don Pedro's bar was going over a rising ground and I saw in the valley about 80 yards ahead of me what I supposed to be some cattle browsing but on taking a second look discovered three large grizzlies one in the road sitting on his haunches the other two standing nearby I quietly turned my mule around and cantered home happy in having avoided a near catastrophe we remained at this place less than two years and carried on a very flourishing business all the while and if the mines had held out could have in a few years made a great amount of money unfortunately my wife became very ill as I supposed with an incurable disease she was confined to bed three years and four months in an almost helpless condition unable to walk a step in all that time but contrary to all expectations, she finally recovered and has enjoyed, enjoyed comparative health ever since. And as she required my constant attention and the most careful nursing, I concluded to give up my interests here and try farming and stock raising. With this aim in view, I, in partnership with my brother, purchased 600 acres of choice land on the Merced River, about six miles below Snelling. A comfortable log cabin was on the place and we hurriedly cleared about 10 acres and planted all the varieties of vegetable and fruit seeds we could obtain, paying the most exorbitant prices for them. We paid as high as $20 per pound for onion seed. We planted in, nurs in nursery some fruit trees purchased in San Jose at $3 a piece. Everything grew and flourished most luxuriantly, giving promise of an abundant harvest but the floods came and all was lost. The river overflowed the whole valley on both sides from hill to hill. Our fine garden was completely swept away and destroyed. Not a dollar's worth was left. The water reached a depth of three feet in our house. It commenced to pour in over the floor about midnight. In a little while, the fire in the stove was drowned out. <coughs> and by morning was two feet above the floor and had almost reached the bed whereon lay my invalid wife. I was entirely alone, my brother and a hired man having gone over on the Tuolumne to drive home some cattle, were caught up in the storm and unable to cross the sloughs to return home. We were also cut off from all help from the neighbors, there being no possible way for them to reach us. The water continued rising, and I, knowing the danger to the sick one if the floods should cover the bed, hastily tore up a floor plank, inserted one end in the wall under the bedstead, raising it half a foot, and placing the other end of the plank on a table. In this way, kept my wife and children above the surging waters. In the meantime, trees and fences and all manner of debris went floating by. 
Our chicken house, with its freight of poultry, was swept away, except a few chickens which flew out and lighted on the trees. And for three fearful hours we expected every moment the house would go. But the house stood, and we were saved. About three o'clock in the afternoon the waters began to recede, and by daylight next morning had entirely subsided. The terrible exposure through which I had passed, and having to continue living in the damp house, brought on a severe attack of pneumonia, and I lay for about ten days hovering between life and death. Having naturally weak lungs, I was on recovery left in a very feeble state, and have never to this day been entirely relieved of, from the effects of this illness. So soon as I was sufficiently restored to be able to travel, I resolved to leave the Merced River forever and endeavor to find a more congenial home where overflows could never reach me. A friend residing at Santa Cruz advised me to go there and I decided to go. But how to get there with my helpless wife? I prepared a swinging bed in a wagon, took her in this way to Stockton, then on a steamer to our destination. But after a six-week sojourn in Santa Cruz, found the climate there unsuited to my weak lungs. I then concluded to go to Benicia. That place had been highly recommended to me as having a delightful climate, a fine harbor, and being centrally located, the commercial facilities were all that could be desired. The state capitol had recently been removed to that place, and the legislature was then in session. The future of Benicia seemed indeed to be very promising. On arriving there, I met an old neighbor from home and at that time, at that time residing in the town of Martinez, just across the straits. He said there was a beautiful sheltered valley back of town that he thought would suit me. And as it came, and as it had just the climate that I was seeking, I immediately went over with him to view out the land and was so charmed with the location that I at once resolved to make this my resting place. Here was a lovely fertile valley protected by high hills from the cold winds and fogs of San Francisco. I have to find where to go from there. Sister Jean typed this, didn't she? My sister? Uh, I'm not sure if she typed that so. one. Were they handwritten letters? Yeah, they were all handwritten. Yeah. All right, let me pick up where I was there. Water coming all directions. No neighbors, can't reach them. <laughs> All right, I found my place now in one of these many pages, sorry. Here was a f lovely fertile valley protected by high hills from the cold winds and fogs of San Francisco, a stream of living water flowing through it. The hills and valley partially covered with magnificent laurel, live oak and white oak trees, and everywhere a green mantle of wild oats from 6 to 12 inches high. I knew at once that the valley was well adapted to fruit growing and thought, here I can realize my long cherished dream of a home surrounded by orange groves and all kinds of fruits and flowers, where I can literally recline under my own vine and fig tree. I immediately purchased 20 acres of the richest valley land, two and a half miles from town, paying $50 per acre, and at once removed my family to the new home there arriving on the 4th of April, 1853. The valley at that time was known as Cañada del Hombre, or Valley of Hunger, so named by a company of Spanish soldiers sent by the governor of California to chastise some Indians, and failing to obtain a sufficiency of provisions in their disgust, called it Hungry Valley. 
Mrs. Strensel, on arriving here, was much displeased with the name, and remembering Irving's glowing description of the flourishing Moorish paradise, decided to christen our new home Alhambra, and the valley has ever since been called Alhambra Valley. It would lengthen this narrative to two great dimensions where I'd write of all the ups and downs, trials and vicissitudes which I passed through during the first years of my long residence here of nearly 37 years, of the many difficulties I had to contend with in the early days in obtaining the right kinds of seeds and trees for planting, often receiving invoices of trees and plants untrue to label, of the many losses and disappointments through inexperienced and unreliable help. But by energy and perseverance and unremitting attention to business, I succeeded in overcoming all obstacles. <laughs> He's kind of cocky too. <laughs> when my first tract of land was filled out, I purchased more and continued to purchase when needed or opportunity offered and plant from year to year up to the present time. My brother continued with me until his death in 1865. He was very energetic, a kind-hearted, benevolent man, and being my only relative, his death was a great blow to me. But the greatest trial of our lives was the death of our only son, a bright, promising boy of nine years who died of diphtheria in September 1857. For years we were inconsolable, the light and hope of our lives seem to have gone out with him. And now, in our old age, we feel the need of him even more than we did at first. Our daughter, Louis Wanda, was educated in Venetia at the Atkins Seminary for Young Ladies. She is very intelligent and intellectual, a great lover of the beautiful in nature and art, and is passionately fond of flowers and music, is benevolent and kind to everyone, ever ready to relieve suffering and to assist in all good works, is social and amiable in disposition and a most devoted mother. She is married to John Muir, the well-known geologist and botanist, has two lovely little daughters, Wanda and Lillian, but no son. She always has been and still is a great comfort and help to her parents. On her marriage, I gave her the old home and built up for myself a new one down the valley, one mile nearer town. My faithful companion and I live very comfortably and quietly in our declining years. We have a commodious house with pleasant surroundings, in the midst of orchards and vineyards, in full view of Martinez and Benicia, and the two overland railroads, the Central and Southern Pacific. We do not travel or visit much, but take great pleasure in having our friends visit us. In politics, I am a Republican, have always taken deep interest in the continued welfare and prosperity of my adopted country, have an abiding faith in the permanency of American institutions and the perpetuity of the Union. What a lovely story. Mm -hmm. He was a pretty impressive man, I think. Absolutely. He and his wife, a couple. I like this part. I am of medium height, light build, blue eyes, brown curly hair, now very white. What he describes as medium height and light build, I was told he was five feet tall and weighed 90 pounds. <laughs> that he was pretty small. People weren't very big in those days. I mean, But I'm not sure if that's true. Apparently Louisiana was a little bigger and put some more robust genes into the yeah. stock, because yeah. we're a little bigger than that today. Um, his command of English, he must have learned English. Yeah, well, he was, he was a doctor, so he, he had a lot of training. Because his native language would have been Polish. Yeah, Polish. But you know, Dad, in those days, you know, I don't know that doctors were educated in the way that they are now, no. you know, no. it was like barbers were surgeons and being a doctor was not such a white collar profession, it was more... Well, it's like John, uh, John Marsh, you know, he claimed to be a physician, mm -hmm. but I don't think he ever really uh, went through medical, I think he went to medical school and dropped out. I think he talks about his education and he clearly was a, was a well-educated man, so... Um, were they naturalized? Were the Strensels, did they become American citizens? 
I don't know. Well, she was uh, Louisiana. Yeah. Was born here. Yeah. Born here. I don't even know, I don't know what, the, what the rules were. I mean, if you marry an American citizen now, you're a citizen. So Dr. Strenzel married a native-born Texan, which in those days I don't know was not part of the United States. It was, uh, in those days, wasn't it the Republic of Texas? I don't think, I don't think Muir was, I, I'm not sure that Muir was a, was a uh, citizen of the United States. He came, he came to America when he was 11 years old mm -hmm. and went to the deep woods of, of Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin. But you don't know whether he became... I don't know about the paperwork. I've never read or heard never anything heard about that. Yeah. I know, you know, you pass through Ellis Island or however you get here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Have you ever been to Scotland to his, you bet. Park, to his home? Yes. Actually, tonight we'll be meeting people from Dunbar that are coming, com coming tonight to, to the Conservation Award. And they're getting an, an award, actually, the John Muir Birthplace Trust. I was there about 10 years ago. It was became, before it became part of the trust over there. Mm -hmm. And a woman, I think she was in the home and owned the building. And it was just, nobody knew who John Muir was at that time. He was mm -hmm. really an unknown. And she was I think they've done a very good job in educating people of Scotland about their native son. You know, they didn't know much about this until about 1980. That, that's recent. Yeah. That's uh, recent. We, met a, we met a young fellow. Uh, what was his name? You know who I mean. Graham. Oh, Graham, Graham White. White. You the, call him a young fellow? Well, he was a... He was younger than you. Yeah, he was a he was a hippie from Scotland, and he was wandering around after he'd been to college, I think, mm -hmm. and around Yosemite, and he got interested in Muir, mm -hmm. and uh, we took a trip with him with a with a newspaper man and a photographer, and, and they wrote some articles about him. But he uh, he went back to Scotland. He says, "I'm going to go back and look into this guy, you know, and find out where he lived and so forth." Because he knew he was, this, uh, by this time he was in the 70s, he knew quite a bit about Muir. And, mm -hmm. and he went back there and, and this little town that he'd lived in, hardly anyone even knew of him. But they keep very strict records of where everyone lived and, you know, the descent, descendants and so forth. And they found the place where he was raised. And he started sort of a, were well, one of the group that he got going there started this thing where they, and, and I, what was it, in 2000, I think they, they voted Muir as a man of the millennium, and they didn't even know who he was 20 years before that. Yeah, yeah. Even when I was there, and it was, that might have been about 1997, 98, so they were just beginning. Were just yeah. beginning. Now, what the Scottish equivalent of the National Park Service, you know, the preserved lands that they have there are owned by the John Muir Trust. Mm -hmm. That's, they named it in honor of, of John Muir. So I think that gives him a lot of exposure in his native land now. People want to know. But they lived in the top floor. I mean, it was like the fourth yeah. floor, just a tiny, like, tiny little place. thing. Tiny little place. Well, they have it fixed up now. They, there was a lot of controversy about it because this is very modern, but it's open and I guess uh, this uh, Graham White, he wanted to keep it pretty much like it was, but uh, he was, he became disenchanted with the whole thing after a while, but because there of... There was a lot of controversy yeah. over that. Right. Um, the courtship between John Muir and Mary Stuart It was one of those things that kind of happened, I guess. He, he, oh no, there were there were matchmakers involved. Well, I think I think multiple John, one. Maybe John Sweat, who was. I don't I don't know, but I know J John Muir was getting along in years to be a bachelor, and certainly Louis was a spinster. You know, women married twenty five. She quite was twenty five. I think. You know, she. And being the the only surviving child of her 
parents. I mean, they were they were looking to marry her, and I know that they were they were introduced. They didn't meet each other accidentally. They were introduced, and I don't recall by by whom. I think nature yeah, took its course. Had, you know, because of course they were neighbors. Um, uh, but, you know, that Mrs. Sweat had something to do. Yeah, I think I think Muir Muir uh, stayed with the Sweats when he came down to visit there. He knew them evidently from some time earlier. Yeah. And Miss, Mrs. Carr probably got into the act. Oh, yeah. We have that wonderful picture of John Sweat and John Muir sitting on the porch of the adobe, the John Sweat adobe. Mm -hmm. And they both look really um, disgruntled, kind of well, just disgruntled. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy Plummer told me that the story is that they had been followed across the creek, uh, like a paparazzi, only it was a photography, had followed them. They were most annoyed uh, because they were wanting to, you know, have a nice <laughs> conversation, and that's why they look the way they do. But I always, I would love to know what they were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, was it horticulture, you know, their crops, park? I mean, what, what, what could you imagine yeah. they were talking about? I actually met John Sweat when I was a very young boy. I think you know. he was a junior one, though. I think he was a son right. of the original one. The, the he was superintendent of public education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was, that was the man was, you know, ancient, the one that I met when I was well, a boy. Yeah. Well, he was in his 70s then, but he, he had gotten the story I had on him, he'd, he'd gotten the measles when he was a young man, in the 20s or something like that. And in those days, they put you in a room. I remember getting the measles. They put you in a room, pulled all the curtains down, and kept it as dark as possible in there, day and night. And he evidently liked it that way, and he stayed there for about 60 years or something in there. I think that was the son. Okay. Yeah, that was the son of, yeah. Yeah, sounds like it. But then, when, when I came back, we always knew that he was, I'd heard about him, I grew up about a mile or less from him. And when I used to practice my horn for two or three hours a day, why well, he used to complain about it for a while until I got a little better at it. And, and I guess it was pretty painful, you know. And, uh, but then when I came back from the war, why well, he was all dressed up and around visiting the neighbors all around and and uh, it was quite the gadabout. about and uh, I think that was the son yeah. and he I think maybe I've mm -hmm. never heard the measles story but um, yeah it sounds like the one I've heard about. Did you have some other things you want to read, uh, Michael? Some of your other I don't know, you want some more? <laughs> don't egg them on, you'll be here all day. <laughs> what an opportunity. <laughs> Well, my, a lot of my cousins. They're interested, yeah. One of them is uh, very interested. Tell them in, about Lundy. I, did, I yeah. started to, okay. yeah. They, uh, that, I was going to say that, that little cabin, it's a little wreck of a thing that was built about 1880, I believe, or in the 1880s. It was when the May Lundy mine was in its heyday. And, uh, it's never had a spot of paint on the outside of it. It's just, and of course, up in that high altitude, uh, wood and things stay preserved pretty well. And uh, it's just a shack is really all it was. And finally, after the war, it was in such shape that you couldn't stay in it. We used to stay in it when my dad was working the mine up above about two miles on back up in the mountain. That was kind of the headquarters where you could drive a car into it. And I, uh, but my brother and I, John, went up there in about, uh, I think about 1980, or maybe late 70s, and there was a kid in town that uh, was a very good carpenter, a young fellow, and uh, he said he loved to work on old things, and we said, why don't you take a ride with us, and we'll show you a project you'd love. <laughs> So he looked at that thing and uh, it was built, it was, wasn't built on any 
regular foundation or anything like concrete. All they did is stacked up rocks and made it as level as they could and they'd lay like a four by six on top of that and they'd build up from there and that thing stayed through all these years and uh, there was quite a town there at one time but now where is this located? near Mono Lake, oh, Mono Lake. but it's back up into the mountains and, and uh, so now it's it's a centerpiece for the whole family I mean all of the of my nephews and nieces and grandnephews and I don't even have them all categorized right but they they all go there and come and go and uh, in the summertime and it's kind of a it's kind of a place where the family hangs together and a lot of times you go up to stay there and there'll be somebody else there and they just move over and they have a they have a motor home outside that they keep there in the summer and it's just kind of a very impromptu thing but uh, yeah, they, I have the account of their travels across the plains. It's quite a few pages. I'm happy to read them if you want. Let's see how far we can take, Brett. You want to keep going? Keep going, yeah. The masterly and glowing description of the climate and resources of California, published in 1846 by Captain Fremont, first drew my attention to the Pacific coast and the great distance but the great distance and the unsettled state of the country at that time prevented me from attempting to go there. The discovery of gold in 1848, ensuring a rapid emigration from every part of the world to that faraway land, offered to me an unexpected opportunity of going. Early in the spring of 1849, a company was organized in our immediate vicinity, consisting of about 135 persons, including myself and family, all well equipped to emigrate to California. On the 22nd of March, all being in readiness, we bid adieu to our friends and homes and commenced the long and perilous journey. There were nine women and 25 children in the train. The women were Mrs. Strensel, Mrs. Gustine, Mrs. Harrison, Mrs. Davis, and her niece, Miss Helen Patty, Mrs. Moss, Mrs. Boods, Mrs. Budget and Mrs. Shackelford. I think I have never known greater courage than was evinced by these brave women in undertaking against the entreaties and advice of friends to go with their children on a trialsome journey of more than 2,000 miles over a trackless wilderness through the midst of hostile Comanches and Apache Indians. We had not even a guide to direct us the way, nothing except a map and a compass to go by. The country was entirely unknown to us, not one of the party ever having been through it. The first 300 miles of the route lay through a fertile country, finely wooded, and excellent grass and water, and we were unmolested by Indians. But traveling was necessarily slow on account of heavy spring rains and severe storms. But the rest of the way, 500 miles to El Paso, was mostly in arid plain with little or no timber and, and scarcity of water and grass, the water in many places so strong with alkali and salt that we could not use it. About the last of May, we all came near being lost for want of water. We traveled two days and one night without finding any and the previous camp had been at a salt spring, so brackish we could not possibly drink it. We made it a rule to take with us from camp every morning some water in canteens in case we should find none through the day. Fortunately, we had a little, which we brought from the camp three days before. My wife had been ill for some time with a severe attack of gastric fever. The second day, the weather being extremely warm, having only one quart of water left, I would give to her and the two little children each a spoonful at a time to moisten their throats. Late in the afternoon, our teams became so exhausted that they began to reel and stagger, seeming ready to drop down, and we had almost given up in despair. The water hunters who had been constantly searching miles away from the train came riding up, waving their hats and shouting, water, water, water. The joy and gratitude of that moment no one can ever understand unless they have passed through the same or a like experience. 
They had found pure, fresh water standing in pools in a ridge of sand hills about 10 miles away. The wagons were stopped and the teams and other stock driven to the water. Some of them were so weak and exhausted they did not reach the water until near morning. While many of the men were attending to the stock, others were bringing water in kegs and canteens to the camp and all alike forgetful of Indians. The next day the teams were brought back and the wagons taken on to the water. That afternoon there occurred a fearful thunderstorm and a regular downpour of rain and hail. My wife was so prostrated with illness and fatigue that I had little hope she could live and after a few hours of rest and quiet she revived and finally recovered. We rested at this place one week resolving not to leave camp in the future without being assured of water at the next. About two weeks previous to this, while we were resting in the camp over Sunday, a band of Indians came dashing up in the afternoon, stampeded the animals, and driving off before our eyes about 35 head of horses and mules. It was all so sudden and our people so taken by surprise that for the moment they could do nothing. The first thing thought of was to get the women and children inside the corral of wagons and prepare for battle, for we knew not how many Indians were surrounding us. The camp being near a stream of water, with timber and underbrush obstructing the view on every side. A consultation was immediately held, and it was decided to follow the Indians and, if possible, to bring back the animals, for we could neither go on or return home without the teams. Within a short time, 60 men had volunteered to go, while the rest were to remain in camp to protect the women and children. They hastily armed and equipped themselves, selecting the best horses left, and in less than an hour were in the saddle and off on the Indian trail. Those left at the camp hurriedly brought the remainder, the remainder of the stock and tied them securely to the wagons, then placed sentinels all around to give the alarm in case of an attack. Thus was the night passed in the greatest suspense. The men in pursuit of the Indians rode all night long, coming upon the Indians early next morning. Our men were ready for battle, but the Indians, evidently surprised, sent a flag of truce and met with protestations of friendship, agreed to give up the stolen horses, saying they mistook us for a caravan of Mexicans with whom they were at war, expressed contrition at having robbed us, and to prove their love for the Americans, the chief and about 20 others kindly escorted our men back to camp, and as further proof of their affection, remained with us two days, going from tent to tent, eating and feasting upon the best of our provisions. <laughs> Although grieved to see the depletion of our stores, we dared not refuse them, for being in the heart of their country, we knew we were completely in their power. On the 20th of May, shortly after the Indian episode, we had a sad duty to perform. Mr. E. S. Cyrus, one of the company who had been in bad health before leaving home, thought a trip across the plains might be beneficial to him, but instead of being restored as he had hoped, he gradually grew worse and died in less than two months. There were three ministers in the train and after holding religious services, the body was laid coffinless in a deep dug grave, carefully covered, and then all the wagons in the train driven over it, so as to obliterate the site as much as possible to prevent desecration by Indians. Mr. Cyrus was the first of six of our little band who died on the way, one of whom was Francis E. Harrison, leaving a widow, now Mrs. G. W. Branch of Modesto, California mother of Leon Branch of San Francisco. On leaving camp at the Sand Hill Pools, the next water found was the, the Pecos River, about 30 miles distant, a narrow, deep, swiftly flowing stream. How were we to cross this river? Not a stick of timber, for aught we knew, within hundreds of miles, large enough to make a raft. But such men as these were always ready for any emergency. They selected two closed wagon beds, caulked them tightly so they were perfectly waterproof, tied empty bags, tied empty kegs on each side to buoy them up, fastened ropes at each end, 
Then two men swam across the river with the ropes, and by pulling the boats back and forth, everything was ferried over. The animals were driven into the river Sheesh. and swam across, and by evening, the whole train was safely over and ready for marching. We caught a number of fine fish in this river, and also in other streams on the way, and occasionally killed deer and antelope and other small game, but never saw a buffalo or elk the whole route. Soon after crossing the river, we came into a good road made by a large train of emigrants from western Texas who had passed only three days before us. What joy to know there were friends so near and like ourselves traveling in these wild wastes. And what relief to have a fine road ready made for us. From here to El Paso, a distance of 200 miles, we met with little or no trouble except from scarcity of water. The last 80 miles there was so little water we were forced to divide the company and travel in small parties of a few wagons so that all might have a sufficiency. We arrived at El Paso the 2nd of July and celebrated the 4th in camp. The Mexicans were very friendly and hospitable. We purchased from them supplies of fresh vegetables, fruits, poultry, etc., which we gratefully enjoyed after our three months journey in the wilderness. El Paso was to us truly an oasis in the desert. We remained at this place until the 14th. While here, the company broke up and scattered. Some few gave up and returned home by way of San Antonio. Many sold their wagons and other effects for what they could get and went on with pack trains. A few remained in El Paso. While the men with families and a few others, patient and level-headed men who were willing to travel slowly, organized and resumed their wearisome journey through the hostile Apaches to the gold fields of the Pacific Coast. Hmm. I can imagine enduring something like that. You think about traveling now and worrying because the road's a little rough or something. Huh? She did. Yeah. She wrote about this story too. And it was those letters that I read that my Aunt Jean, my father's sister, she painstakingly typed up all of these things from old records. You know, I realized <coughs> that my great-great-grandmother had made it across this country, you know, with a baby in one arm and a toddler on the other and, you know, hostile Indians and no water and, you know, made this journey. And that made me believe that I could do it too. And it was these records and dotting the, the places on the map where they'd been. We used the way that they traveled when we went across the country the other way. We used their landing point at the Mission San Diego as our starting point. And we went backwards on the old Butterfield Trail to Honey Grove. We left the, we the end of January and we arrived in Honey Grove by the 4th of July for a family reunion there. We still have family. The Irwin family still has descendants there. In my Hunter wife Grove, and Texas. I and, and my brother John and his wife, we all went back there and met them they, at, they, at the 4th of July. They did, they did, they did, you did accompany no. Tell, Mike, tell about that journey, Michael, because I don't think we, you mentioned that. Well, in, you know, I've been a horseman my whole life and the effects of MS and I've had several hip surgeries, it became difficult to ride and I no longer rode horses by the time I reached about the age of 40. And I turned to driving, carriage driving, and then okay. began competing in a sport called combined driving and that led me to the organization called United States Driving for the Disabled that was recruiting a team of drivers, carriage drivers with disabilities to go to the first world championship for these drivers <coughs> in Wolfsburg, Germany in 1998. And I met an amazing bunch of people there from different countries of the world, all with disabilities and all using horses to compete in this fantastic sport. And we hatched a plan to drive across the United States. And I went with a, a really diverse group of people from all over the world, a young man from Mexico who's blind since birth, and a paraplegic man from Germany, two fellows from, uh, from Sweden who were 59 and 61 at the time. They'd known each other since they were little boys with polio and uh, they, they'd been friends and had always wanted to see the great American Southwest. They came over. 
couple sisters from Great Britain came. One was a survivor of a terrible uh, injury that left her uh, a hemiplegic and uh, severely brain damaged. Her they sister came was, at different times. They, at different times. Not everybody went all the way across the United States. The young man from Mexico went from coast to coast and I did and one of our helpers made it all the way. But all these other people played a part in it and drove these wheelchair accessible carriages from the Mission San Diego to Washington DC. It took us almost 10 months. That was a lot. Yeah. Sure. But I just like, you know, um, it's always kind of nice to end with this kind of a, um, well, what accomplishments are you most proud of? And what is the one thing you most want people to remember you by? We can start with you, mm -hmm. uh, Ross. I haven't given any thought to that. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I would say, you know, I'm sure what my father will be remembered for is he's a remarkably, has a remarkably generous spirit. And he, he was a good father, good to his family and good to his community. People remember what he's done for them. He's a musician his entire life and has had a lot of fun with his band. And he's always been there for the people of the little town that was his adopted town, Dixon. So. I'm sure people will remember him long after he's gone, and his family certainly will. He founded a, a large and flourishing family, which uh, descends from him, and I mean, I, I think that's a great legacy to have. How many grandchildren? Uh, let's see, I have one, well, I have four grandchildren. Four grandchildren. And, and one granddaughter has three children and another one on the way. And, uh, so I don't know how many we're going to have out of that one. From the great-grandchildren. Great-grandchildren are still in production. And it looks yeah. like there's going to be plenty of those. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. And Michael, what about you? Well, for me, I hope, you know, the, the big accomplishment in my life certainly is, is Access Adventure, which I'm going to show you a little bit more about. I'm very proud of that. It's something that, you know, maybe I have the idea about. I want to make sure that People understand that it's not just me, though, that does it. I, it's, a, it's run entirely by a band of volunteers that are very devoted. There's a lot of them here working today. A lot of them work long hours to do this work. And it makes me feel connected to John Muir, too, who encouraged people to enjoy nature. And it's, it's maybe a little bit of a continuation of his legacy. And, and I hope we can build it. and and make it happen and make it continue on beyond me. So that's what I'd like to leave behind. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite quote, a favorite quote of John Muir's that you kind of, that's kind of your motto? There's a lot of them. There are, there are so, so many that are meaningful at different times. Um, and we often use them in the things that we, we write about the healing power of nature and why it's important to stay connected to nature. <coughs> you know, if you want to say something, it's always best to go to the source, and that's John Muir because he, he said it the best. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you so much. This has okay. been uh, just wonderful. And I think if we have time, Brett, if we have time, mm -hmm. we can take the camera and maybe we can give us some. Sure, I'd be happy to show you around. You might want to have a look at the blacksmith shop, and I'm going to see if our horses are working and all. All right. Well, we'll demonstrate how the wheelchair lift works. And yeah. Okay. Okay. So do any of you have any questions? Okay. We're getting to ask you. All right. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, this has been These wagons are something to see. They.
It's supposed to look like that. It's, a, it's out of a railroad spike. It's supposed to be a knife. Cool. Yeah. Oh, so you took that railroad spike and took the camera and then it was Robbie. Took me a couple hours. So you heat it up and then. Just keep pounding. 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 It's not sharp. Notch. That's that around. Ah. That means that blade goes down. So how long have you been doing that black around? Uh, about a year and a half ago. Just one little teeny bit. And later when they got a uh, speed, then they see. put this wheel on there to drive it with speed. Go ahead, have a seat. Can you reach it? Both Can you reach it? That's cool. I want the wheel to go this direction. Yeah. Okay, so. Get it going. Fingers. Now sharpen this. You don't want to do it? I'll do it in the other way. Go the other way. Go the other way. Yeah. Okay, now go. Should have bought them. Should have bought Is that a spin wheel? Yeah. Well, you watch the Disney movies, oh, they sharpen, sharpen their swords that way. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how fast. Sharpen this one. So, do you have to put it a certain way? Here, I'll hold that. Thank you. Let's take the uh, Would you, do you know? Uh, Wrong way. Wrong way. You have to go the other way. Now you go. Yeah. So normally there would be water in this dripping on there. Keep going. Oh, to keep it wet? Yeah. And this would keep that water from splashing on you. Oh. <laughs> Not in the groove, though. Some kid did that kind of ruined it. Oh. He did what? He did that and ruined it. What you were doing, just make a groove. We don't want to do that. That's good. That's not that wrong way. Yeah, this is on the way. <laughs> the one most popular tool in the whole shop is this. Yeah. <laughs> is this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, we'll get sharp if you're not careful. You keep it. <laughs> I have to keep making a doll. <laughs> yeah, or, or next thing you know, it's like down to there. <laughs> <laughs> Got quite a bit of open space as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I've got another project coming up here. Uh, that's a permanent one. These are portable forging here that we can take away to other places around the ranch. Or around town. We do it at other ranches to demonstrate. Let me give you an example you can check out here. What you do is you build a coal fire and then you have to blow air to it to make it hot enough. So you turn the crack and put your hand there. You don't have your hands full like she did. Okay, that's all we're doing up there is pumping air through a coal fire to make it hot enough to melt iron if you want to get it that hot. Normally you get it warm to about 550 somewhere. That's a red. If you get it hotter than that, it will turn orange. If you get hotter than that, it will turn yellow. That's up to around 12, 14 degrees. If you keep it getting it hot, it will go up to about 2,000 degrees, and that's where you weld two pieces of metal together by hammering them. The old, you know, the old-fashioned hammer welding together. So, uh, 
We only operate normally here down in the five to eight hundred degrees. No, we wouldn't do to get the metal hot and bend it or shape it. Uh, one of the things we worked on today is this old wagon out here. We rebuilt the wagon, but we have to put a longer tongue, you know, it's outside. We have to put a longer tongue on it so the four horses can pull the wagon. And he plans on using it in the uh, too soon Christmas uh, program. So, uh, I've been sharing the time between working with him and working with the wagon there today. But uh, these two young boys wants to make a nail. I know. <laughs> the old-fashioned square nails is what we usually start as okay. a newcomer on in here in the blacksmith shop. Okay. We give him a piece of metal to start hammering on. That's what I want. And shape it. <laughs> I can get some aggression now. <laughs> and put a head on the nail. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All Would right. you all like a ride? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Tell them if you want to help load. Yeah. Come on, Daddy. You want a little break? If necessary, we'll take another trip. No, you and your friend are going to help. There's also a blacksmith, too. Uh, if anybody wants to see that. So why don't you guys check that out during this ride? Because he'll be shutting down here. So, and then we'll take you on the next. So we'll go see the back. Yeah. yeah, we'll make sure everybody gets the ride. Thank you. Oh, oh. Yeah, up there with your legs. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Injury? You got an injury? 